गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू द फोर्थ एनुअल होमी भाभा मेमोरियल पब्लिक लेक्चर वी आर ग्लैड टू हैव विथ अस आर एस्टीम स्पीकर प्रोफेसर सुबीर सचदेव फ्रॉम हार्वर्ड यूनिवर्सिटी ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ आइसर पुणे वी वुड लाइक टू एक्सप्रेस आर ग्रैटिट्यूड टू प्रोफेसर सुबीर सचदेव हु हैज़ ट्रैवल फ्रॉम हार्वर्ड यूनिवर्सिटी टू विजिट एस एट आइसर पुणे वी होप ही हैज़ अ गुड टाइम इन आइसर एंड एन्जॉयज हिज इंटरक्शन विद फैकल्टी एंड स्टूडेंट्स एट आइसर पुणे I now invite Professor Sunil Mukhi, Chair of Physics Department at ISR Pune, to speak a few words about Dr. Homi Bhabha. Thank you all for coming. It's an extraordinary pleasure that we are now at the fourth annual Homi Bhabha Memorial Lecture, and as is the custom, I will say a few words about Homi Bhabha, and then we will actually Nabamita will actually introduce uh, Professor Sachdev, and then he'll give you his talk. Uh, but this time, for a little variety, I decided to throw in a two-minute uh, movie, which is actually a recording of uh, some uh, voices. So I'll tell, uh, including Homi Bhabha. So I'll I'll very briefly uh, tell you about his life for those who don't know much about him. He was born in 1909 in a family of industrialists and went to Gonville and Keys College in Cambridge uh, for a degree in mechanical engineering. Now. His family wanted him to join Tata Steel as a metallurgist, but something happened to him when he reached Cambridge, and he uh, decided he wanted to do physics, and said, I have no desire to be a successful man or the head of a big firm. These are his words. He actually studied under Dirac for the math Tripos exam, and in 35, he wrote a landmark paper on electron-positron scattering, which is now known as Bhabha scattering, uh, it's a very fundamental contribution to particle physics. It's an experimentally detected contribution to the amplitude for electrons and positrons to scatter and required him to understand the Dirac theory, which was extremely new at that time. In 36, he wrote a paper on cosmic ray showers, and uh, this was to be an interest of his in later life as well. Uh, at a very young age, in 41, he was elected fellow of the Royal Society, and C.V. Raman, who is uh, of course, uh, this auditorium is named after, described Bhabha as a modern Leonardo da Vinci, which is high praise indeed, uh, for his artistic abilities. Now, in 43, Bhabha decided to set up an advanced institute in uh, Bombay with help from the Tatas and the government. And um, TIFR started in 540 square meters of hired space uh, in 1945. Beyond starting a fundamental research institute, Bhabha's advocacy also led to the Atomic Energy Act, and in 54, uh, the Atomic Energy Establishment, later renamed Bhabha Atomic Research Center, as well as the Department of Atomic Energy. Now, in 54, his dreams of a fundamental research institute started to come true when the foundation stone of TIFR campus was laid by Pandit Nehru. Uh, and in 1955, Bhabha presided over a UN conference on peaceful uses of atomic energy in Geneva. So you can see he had sort of two lives by this time. One focused on fundamental research and administering TIFR, and the other focused on atomic energy, which he was in which he had a lot of faith. Uh, in 62, the TIFR building was inaugurated by Pandit Nehru, and the video you're going to see it's really an audio with photographs, uh, has the speeches given uh, by three different people on that occasion in 1962. I'll tell you in a moment. Now, uh, I think the key to Bhabha's thinking is contained in this little nugget, which is the opening line of the, of the government of India's scientific policy resolution uh, in 1958, which Bhabha helped to draft. The key to national prosperity, apart from the spirit of the people, lies in the modern age in the effective combination of three factors, technology, raw materials, and capital. The first is perhaps the most important since new scientific techniques can make up for a deficiency in natural resources and reduce the demands on capital, but technology can only grow out of a study of science and its applications. Now, this is the government's scientific policy resolution, and if you like, it's one of the reasons why we are all here today. Uh, it was in 1958 that the government made a clear statement in support of basic science. Now, uh, that's all I have to say, but I think I'll show you nice pictures of, these, of this trinity of people who were responsible for founding TIFR, uh, but more importantly, who created a collaboration among three pillars of society, uh, which is absolutely essential for science to flourish, 
So on the one hand, you have India's leading industrialist. On the other hand, you have the Prime Minister of India. And on the third, you have Homi Bhabha, the leading, one of the leading scientists and science administrators. And it's the partnership between these three people uh, that really set up the institutions that we know uh, to, that have flourished since then. Uh, today is also Jawaharlal Nehru's birthday, by the way. Uh, Bhabha's birthday was on 30th of October. And uh, now what I'll do is I'll play you a two or three minute uh, clip, uh, which will have speeches by first J.R.D. Tata, then Homi Bhabha, and then uh, Pandit Nehru. Uh, the sound is not great. This is from 1962. The occasion is that eight years after Pandit Nehru laid the foundation stone of TIFR, he came back to inaugurate the building and work formally started. So that's the occasion, and I hope the audio is uh, reasonable, though I'm not completely sure. Your Excellency, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Chief Minister, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to add my own welcome to that extended to you a moment ago by the governor. Many of those present here today were probably here on this very site exactly eight years and 14 days ago today, when uh, you, Mr. Prime Minister, were good enough to lay the foundation stone, which can be seen at the corner of the building, we were grateful for your presence then, sir. But we are even more grateful and happy for it today. For in the in intervening years, you have given us constantly renewed proof of your sustained interest in the work that is being done here an interest without which this institute could never have grown to its present stature of one of the leading centers of fundamental research in the world. Uh, this institute was founded in 1945. It is only today, some 16 and a half years later, that we are, that you, sir, are going to inaugurate this uh, building. Now, by fundamental research, I mean basic investigation into the behavior uh, and structure of the physical world without any consideration regarding their utility or whether the knowledge so acquired would ever have a practical value. The support of such research and of an institution where such research can be carried out effectively is of great importance to society. It has an immediate use in that it helps to train and develop in a manner which no other mental discipline can. Young men of the highest intellectual caliber in a society into people who can think about and analyze problems with a freshness of outlook and originality which is not generally found. Such men are of great value to society. So I'm happy to be here today to associate myself again in this function with this institute. We really have a very fine lot of younger scientists in India. It is meeting them and finding out what they have been doing that uh, I have felt so hopeful about the future of science in India. I would like uh, this example of Dr. Bhabha, that is to build up these groups of young scientists wherever there is the opportunity in India, to give them worthwhile work to do and opportunities to be followed all over this country. Now if I am supposed to inaugurate this formally or to declare this open formally, I do so with great pleasure. Okay, and I'd now like to ask Nabamita Banerjee to come up and introduce the speaker. Hello all. It's really an honor for me to introduce Professor Subhi Sajdev to you all. Thank you. Uh, as you have heard, he is a professor in theoretical condensed matter physics in Hubbard University. To tell you very briefly about his academic career, he did his schooling from Bangalore. And from there, for higher studies, he went to IIT Delhi, followed by um, MIT. And then he finally got his PhD from Harvard University in theoretical physics. After finishing his PhD, he moved to Bell's lab for his postdoctoral studies, and then joined Yale University as a professor in physics. Finally, he moved back to Harvard in 2005 again as a professor in theoretical physics department. 
So in his days long academic career, he has done some seminal works and he has also been awarded by many prestigious awards and medals for that. The list is really long and I'll just tell you about the recent few words. In 2014, he has been elected the Fellow of National Academy of Science by US. And then just in the following year, in 2015, he was awarded by Dirac Medal. And finally, uh, just this year, he has been awarded by um, American Physical Society with the last Onsaga Prize, which is the most prestigious one in his field. So of course, uh, all these prizes already says that he has done some extremely good work in his field. And um, I'll just mention again about some of them. So he has done uh, seminal works on uh, quantum phase transitions and quantum critical points, fractional spin liquids. His works on antiferromagnets and iron-based superconducts are, are very highly cited. And recently, he has discovered the topological order phases in quantum matters, on which he gave an extremely good talk yesterday. So before I uh, go ahead to um, finally call him here on stage, I just want to tell you a small story how I was uh, introduced to his name. I was a, a PhD student at HRI when one of our string journal clubs, there was a paper discussed. This is back in 2007. And that paper was about the quantum phase transitions in condensed matter system and its relation to dionic black holes. So um, Professor Subhi Sajdev was one of the co-author of that paper. And we were, all of us, the students and the faculty members, we were very happy to see that some techniques of string theory, which you probably, all, almost all of you have heard about, holography or ADS-CFT, was used to find this connection between these two systems. And someone uh, as distinguished as Professor Sajdev from the condensed matter community to be a co-author of that paper was also very enthusiastic for us. After that, there has been many other works where such connections have been built by using holographic technique. Many of them have been authored by Professor Sajdev himself and other uh, physicists from both the topics. So his today's talk is again on strange metals and black holes. This is again a kind of a connection between these two different systems. To tell you very briefly, strange mat metal is a metallic, special metallic states of matter, whereas black holes uh, appear naturally as solutions of Einstein's general theory of relativity. So he will tell us how these two systems are connected. And for that, I'll invite Professor Sishtev here. Hello. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much, Navamita, for a very kind introduction. And thank you, Sunil, for the invitation to be here on this uh, wonderful occasion of celebrating the life of Homi Baba and his contributions to science. And as you said, very justly, justly said, neither of us would be here doing basic physics if it wasn't the vision for the people uh, that uh, Sunil mentioned. All right, so as Navabita mentioned, I'm going to talk about strange metals and black holes. Uh, and these are systems that are studied uh, by two very different types of physicists. Uh, metals are, you know, ordinary metals like iron or silver, where you're studying electrons moving in these little crystals and how they interact with each other. And black holes are astrophysical objects, uh, which are way out there in the universe, uh, which obey Einstein's theory of general relativity. Uh, and it would seem that there's almost nothing they have to do with each other. But strangely enough, they turn out to be very deeply connected. Uh, and that connection has been a topic of much research in the last 20 years. And it's still continuing, a lot of excitement and new ideas developing. Uh, and I'm just going to try to present these ideas uh, in hopefully a comprehensible way uh, so that you get a sense as to uh, uh, where theoretical physics is moving today, at least the parts that I like. Uh, so the key idea behind all of this is a more fundamental idea that goes back really to the early days of quantum mechanics, uh, and that's the concept of quantum entanglement. So now I'm not going to assume that uh, the audience here is familiar with quantum mechanics and all its uh, details, but there are two simple ideas that you, I will explain, which hopefully will make, you, make it able for you to follow uh, the connection between these two different systems. So the central idea of quantum mechanics, so let's just go back to the very beginning of quantum mechanics, uh, is the idea of superposition. And this is an idea that's not present uh, in Newtonian theory of mechanics. It has no meaning there at all. 
but it's something that was absolutely essential at the very heart of why the quantum theory revolutionized our understanding of the physical world. So uh, here I show uh, a, a, uh, a kind of a simulation or a movie of the famous double slit experiment. So what we have here is an electron gun, which is sending out electrons. Uh, this is the gun that you see in the old TV tubes. So the electrons are coming out and they go through two slits and eventually they hit the screen. And what you see here is a picture of the electrons coming one by one, uh, making a pattern. So they, they make this what's called an interference pattern where there's more electrons coming here and none over there and so on. Okay, so this pattern, however, if you look at the modulation, the average density of electrons, this pattern is something that can be understood in a very different way. Suppose instead of electrons, you had waves, water waves, that are coming through these slits. And, and what you notice then is that there are these red points here where it's always dark, and there's the black points uh, where it's brighter. Uh, and so this is what's called an interference pattern of water waves. Uh, and so there's this modulation in the intensity of water waves on the screen, uh, which is, in fact, mirrors precisely the distribution of electrons. So this uh, picture illustrates the central contradiction, if you wish, but it's not a contradiction, in quantum mechanics, which is the basic question you sometimes get, is the electron a wave or a particle? Uh, and the short answer really is that it's both. Uh, it's a wave in the sense that this electron is a wave that interferes uh, as it goes through these two slits uh, and then hits the screen. And you could say, all right, well, why, why don't we just, why don't we be done with that and call it a wave because it looks like a wave. Uh, but on the other hand, unlike a water wave, it arrives like a bullet, it arrives one by one. You know, it arrives at a given point. It isn't spread out everywhere. So it has a part particle-like character. It comes uh, in little blips. But it, uh, after looking at many different electrons coming in, the distribution here looks like a wave. So, so that's, you know, that's an experimental fact. This kind of experiment is done every day, I'm sure, in laboratories here too. Uh, and it's certainly this is what you see. So how do we understand this? Well, to understand this, we have to introduce a fundamental new concept, the concept of superposition. Uh, and I'll just give you a, a very elementary presentation of it. So, imagine, so here's the, the same question again, another picture of the same experiment. We are sending electrons in through two slits to form this interference pattern. Uh, now, if I close one of the slits, uh, so sorry. Uh, now let me think of the electron as a particle that can either go through the left, uh, left slit, and I'll call the state of the electron when it goes through the left slit L, uh, and I'll call the state of the electron that goes through the right slit R. Uh, and if you want to understand what happens here, uh, and see, when you see this interference, it's really necessary for the electron really to go through both, because it's, only, it's precisely the, uh, for, for waves too, it was the fact that the wave came through two different sources that led to the interference pattern. So we are led to the conclusion that the electron is in a rather strange superposition state, as we call it, that it's both left and right. So uh, there can be various numbers here, and this can be made very precise. Uh, but we allow for an electron to be both on the left and the right, and that is the state it's in. You know, if you try to look for it, you will see it either on the left or the right. Uh, for example, if you've, shown, if you've shown light and looked at the electrons as they're passing through, you either see it here or you either see it there. You won't see it at both places. Uh, but when you look for it, you'll find you'll destroy the pattern. So the only way you get the pattern is if you don't look at it and you let it go through and you postulate that while you weren't looking at it, it was in this superposition state. So that sounds you know, intu uh, intuitively when you first hear it as completely crazy, but uh, I suppose after you've seen it enough times and, and you realize it's actually logically completely a consistent uh, way to think about things, uh, we just have to allow for a, a possibility of adding and even subtracting different states. And that's what leads to this interference pattern. Uh, it's the same kind of idea that you know, helps us understand the structure of a hydrogen atom, a helium atom, and in fact, the entire periodic table, chemical bonding. Really, almost everything in life follows uh, on a microscopic scale once we understand uh, the basic superposition idea. All right, so that's a, that's a two-minute summary then. Uh, of a whole year of quantum mechanics, but really that's the basic idea that you have to hold in your mind, uh, the idea of superposition. So now we can jump ahead to the idea of entanglement. What is entanglement? 
Well, entanglement is basically superposition, but when you have more than one electron. So let's consider the simplest physical situation where you have two electrons. So in a hydrogen atom, you have one electron, and here I've donated, uh, denoted the electron by an arrow pointing up because uh, that represents the spin of the electron, so that's an electron maybe spinning on its axis clockwise. Uh, here's a hydrogen atom with two uh, electrons. These are, the, these are the nuclei. And what we know is that in a hydrogen covalent bond, the electrons are in a superposition state, which is denoted over here and also here. So the left electron is spin up in this state, and the right electron is spin down. So that's one possible state of the electron. And the other possible state is the spins are reversed, where the left is down and the right is up. Uh, and so which of these is the answer? Well, the answer is both. Just like the, like, a single electron could be left and right, the pair of electrons are in the state this way and that way, both at the same time. Uh, we won't worry about this minus sign here. That's for accuracy. Uh, but that's a certain convention in how you write down the, way, the state of the pair of electrons. So in this particular state, uh, what's happening to one electron is tightly correlated with the other one. If one is left up, down, the other is up, and vice versa. And so, roughly speaking, we say that these electrons are entangled with each other because they share a state in which their positions are correlated. Okay, so that seems, uh, you know, okay, we can accept it because when you solve the equations for this, uh, we come up with a pretty satisfactory theory for the stability of a hydrogen molecule. But however, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen uh, in 1935 said there's something really fishy about this. Uh, imagine I take a, a hydrogen molecule and imagine doing an experiment, it's a thought experiment, uh, where I separate the two electrons. So I somehow take one electron and leave it here and I take the other electron uh, and put it on the moon. And I say I can do an experiment where I can separate them without disturbing their spin. So I have to very carefully apply the right sort of electric fields uh, so that you don't disturb the spin of each electron. Uh, then the claim is that if, as you separate them, they'll still be entangled. So if this electron here in this room would be, if it's up, then I know for sure the electron on the moon is down and vice versa. Uh, and, and in fact, both electrons still share that entangled state. So now that you're getting something extremely non-local. You have the state that's shared by the electron, but there's still no, in some sense, if you wish, what the other electron is doing instantaneously. Uh, so what this means is that if I measure uh, one electron to be down, the other one will be up and vice versa. And this is what EPR called the paradox. Uh, it seems as if if I see this electron to be down, the other one is up, which is on the moon. Uh, and, uh, and if I see this to be up, uh, then, then the other one's uh, uh, down. And Einstein pointed out that this is, this is totally unacceptable. There's no way that a measurement here determines the state of an electron really far away. Okay, so that was 1935, and now, uh, almost 100 years later, uh, we know this is not a paradox. In fact, it's the truth. People have done these type of experiments and indeed seen entanglement over long scales where the state, in particular in the experiment, is usually a photon here, determines the polarization of a photon here, determines a polarization somewhere else. And so how do we accept this? You know, it seems extremely non-local. Uh, well, I think the way you accept is that the idea of a state uh, that these two electrons share uh, is not a local idea. It's, it does not as if this state of this electron sits right here. That electron is entangled with an electron really far away, uh, and that state is really nowhere. It's shared by them. So it's not as if some, you're doing something here and that information is traveling all the way there. They share the same state, so you can perturb the state either here or there. Uh, and uh, once you accept that, then this doesn't seem like a paradox at all. It doesn't lead to any logical contradictions, for sure. All right, so that's a lightning summary of quantum entanglement. I mean, this was for the longest time viewed as a, uh, you know, some kind of intellectual curiosity that only philosophers worried about uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics need to think about, and the rest of us were just going ahead and calculating and finding all kinds of successes with the quantum theory. Uh, but today, the idea of quantum entanglement has really moved to the center of physics because we are finding in many different domains, strange metals and black holes, it's really fundamental to physical properties, uh, which is entanglement not just between 
two electrons in a hydrogen atom, but entangled be between millions of electrons over, over long scales. And that's uh, really the idea that that new idea of entanglement over multiple scales and many particles leads to new types of phenomena that allow you to connect uh, very different physical systems. All right, so, so I've summarized what's quantum entanglement. Uh, so now let me tell you a little bit about strange metals. Uh, and as we'll see, entanglement plays a fundamental role. Uh, but before we get to strange metals, let's just talk about ordinary metals, uh, like copper or iron or aluminum or something like that. So these have ordinary metals we know have certain basic properties. They're shiny. They're good conductors of heat and electricity. And to understand these very basic properties, you do need quantum mechanics. Uh, you cannot understand it from Newtonian theory. Uh, so what happens in each metal is that the outermost electron uh, of the metal uh, delocalized from the atom. So the atoms form a regular crystal, uh, and some of the electrons delocalize completely, and they travel through the entire wire or crystal, as it may be, quite freely. Uh, and this delocalization and the ability of the electrons to travel as waves through the entire crystal are fundamental to these properties. Okay, so to understand these properties, then we have to figure out uh, how these 10 to the 23 electrons that are in a given chunk of copper, uh, which are delocalized, uh, interact with each other. So the electrons repel each other as they're moving, they're going to feel each other, and you have to solve for the equations of so many electrons interacting with each other. It's not an easy task, but it's something we've succeeded in doing over the last 30, 40 years of study in solid state physics. And there's a simple idea that makes it work. Uh, it's the idea of a quasi-particle. So what happens, is, roughly speaking, is you have one electron, say, moving through a metal. It's going to interact with all the other electrons. Uh, and what happens when the dust settles, so to speak, uh, is that it's still an electron, and it's got a cloud of other electrons which are shaking as it moves by. So if you don't look too closely, that composite object, which has a rather complicated structure, looks basically like an electron. Uh, it's got some mass, it's got some, it's got a, it has the charge of an electron, uh, and then we can write down some equations of motion for this quasi-electron and how it collides with other quasi-electrons. Uh, and the basic idea is that this, these quasi-particles, of course, are difficult to describe exactly what's going on inside a quasi-particle. Uh, but once you assume it's there, the different quasi-particles hardly interact with each other. They just behave independently. So this is kind of an assumption you make to start the theory. Uh, and lo and behold, we find that it works beautifully. So uh, today you can you know, predict the properties of something like copper or silicon or diamond you know, very precisely, uh, even you know, uh, numerically precisely, in a theory built upon the idea uh, of a quasi-particle. Okay, so, so that's you know, see, it's a, one of the great successes of the application of quantum mechanics to real-world phenomena. So, one of the, so these quasi-particles, as I said, hardly feel each other. So if you kick a metal, or if you're driving some current to the metal, you just create some quasi-particles that start moving. And they basically move independently of each other. But eventually, they do feel each other. They start colliding. Uh, and as Boltzmann taught us already in the 19th century, when you have a bunch of particles colliding with each other, they'll form a, a thermal distribution, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Uh, that has to be modified because there's a, the, the quantum particles, so you have something called the Fermi distribution. Uh, of these quasi-particles, and that'll tell you that you're in thermal equilibrium. So eventually, after some time, if you inject some current in an electron, it'll heat up a little bit, and it'll, become, it'll come to equilibrium at some temperature. And this process of how these quasi-particles equilibrate can be de described very simply by just an extension of Boltzmann ideas, because they rather interact with each other relatively weakly. All right, so that's a summary in five minutes of a graduate course in condensed matter physics. <laughs> so you're moving quite along. You did quantum mechanics, entanglement, and now you're done with condensed matter physics. This is the basic central idea of many books, and it's very successful. So now we turn to the strange metals. Uh, and these appear uh, in a new class of materials which are discovered in, in 1987, uh, which incidentally was the year I, I began my postdoc. And so I jumped onto this field because it's uh, seem to be a very exciting set of problems that needed to be understood. Uh, so I don't want to go into the details of the structure of one of these materials, like yttrium barium copper oxide. Here's a, here's a little crystal of it. Uh, the basic 
things we're going to need is that what's important for these materials is this square lattice here, and the electrons basically move on a square lattice in planes, and the, these planes are separated from each other. Here's another plane, there's a plane over here, plane over here, and so on. Uh, and we want to understand how the electrons are moving in these planes. And what we have discovered through many, uh, many experiments, uh, this is V in the com as a community, uh, that the quasi-particle idea, this all-powerful tool that allowed us to understand ordinary metals uh, completely fails over here. So here's a little piece of this yttrium barium copper oxide, and I have a little movie here. Hopefully it's going to work. Uh, these are a bunch of magnets. That's a little, little a piece, uh, a cake of yttrium barium copper oxide, which, has, which was dipped in liquid nitrogen, uh, and right now it's floating uh, over these magnets. Uh, so, it, so when it's dipped in liquid nitrogen, it becomes a superconductor, which means that it can conduct uh, currents without any resistance, strictly zero resistance. Uh, and one of the features of that is that because of the ability to conduct cur currents, the eddy currents when you apply a magnetic field are very strong, and it basically expels all magnetic fields. And that's why it's floating above the magnets. So if you give it a little push... Well, it didn't last very long, but uh, why did it crash? Anybody have a guess? Sorry? Yeah, the temperature rose. It became, it, it went above its critical temperature for superconductivity, and so it no longer expels magnetic field. So as long as you kept it cold, it'll just keep going. All right, so that's a high temperature superconductor, uh, and this is an experiment, uh, you know, I'm sure maybe it could be are done, are done in laboratories here. Uh, and here's, uh, okay, this is the last bit of technicality, if you wish. Uh, this is the phase diagram, just to tell you how I spend my day staring at pictures like this. Uh, this is the density of electrons uh, in, per copper in this layer, which you vary by varying the concentration of oxygen. Uh, this is temperature, and there's various phases. This is the superconducting phase. Here's the critical temperature I just mentioned, and I won't say anything about this. What I want to focus on the rest of my talk is this strange metal. So this is the metal right above TC, uh, where, where the behavior is metallic. Uh, it uh, uh, conducts electricity, but many properties are strange. And I'll send you, tell you about what's strange about them in a, in a minute or two. Uh, and what's also very clear now is that the reason they're strange is because of entanglement. So what's happening here, this very, uh, you know, almost philosophical discussion of uh, entanglement affecting things at long scales uh, is nothing but, is not philosophical at all. It's that you have these trillions of electrons in this copper oxygen layer which are entangled with each other in some very complicated way that is in some ways still struggling to understand. There's no quasi-particles that emerge and look like little lumps that move independently. The whole thing is like a soup that flows and we're trying to understand how it flows and how entanglement is preventing the appearance of particles that move uh, ballistically like a bullet. It's just, it's really much more complicated. And, and this strange metal is what, uh, uh, you know, is in some many ways still an open problem uh, in, in theoretical physics to try to understand what's going on here. And you could ask, you know, why do we care so much? Well, the reason we care so much, what we really want to do if you want to make a lot of money or make our funders happy is to raise TC to even higher values, maybe up to room temperature. That's a dream that maybe someday that'll happen. Well, so we want to be able to calculate and predict the critical temperature for superconductivity. Well, it's clear that there's no way we're going to be able to do that unless we understand what we're up against. Uh, the bad guy is a strange metal that's appearing above TC. So if we somehow get rid of it, maybe TC will go up. Uh, so how do we get rid of it? Uh, so that's really the... Well, we can't get rid of it until we understand more about it. So, so that's why it's really crucial to... It's really the heart of everything that's going on, which I won't say more about. All right. So the strange metal is sometimes has a number of other names. Uh, people call it bad metal or an incoherent metal. Uh, see, there are other pejorative uh, adjectives. Uh, but really, these are technical terms. Uh, so it's strange because the resistivity, when you heat the system up, the resistivity increases as a linear power of temperature. In most other metals, in ordinary metals, it will be T squared. Uh, and so that's a very strange thing. That's why it was called a strange metal. It's bad because, well, uh, the resistivity is also very large. Now, it turns out, this is another 
uh, amazing thing that was discovered in thinking about collective flows of electrons and materials. Uh, fundamental units of nature, in particular Planck's constant H and the charge of an electron, this particular combination has the units of resistance, which is, it turns out to be 26.2 kilo ohms. Uh, so in two dimensions, resistivity and resistance have the same units, uh, and it turns out that this particular strange metal has a resistivity much bigger than the fundamental unit of resistivity. Now, if you took an ordinary metal and made it, made it so resistive, the way you make it resistive is by making it dirtier and dirtier and dirtier uh, so that the electrons can't flow. By the time you make it so dirty that the resistance is so large, it'll become an insulator. The electrons will basically get trapped. So, so, that's what's, so it's a bad metal because the resistance is so high, but it's still a metal, and that's the amazing thing that we want to understand. And it's incoherent, not because we, can't, we don't understand it. Uh, it's incoherent because there are no quasi-particles. <laughs> okay, so that's what these terms mean. Uh, all right, so now what I'm going to present uh, something that people are calling the SYK model, and I'm happy to accept that name. Uh, that uh, is a toy model, as you'll see. It's a model that allows us to really understand uh, entanglement in a metal leading to breakdown of quasi-particles. So I'm just going to give you a rough picture of it, but if you want to know a bit more details, there's a seminar tomorrow where I will actually write down a few equations. But here I'm just going to show some pictures. So here's the thought experiment uh, uh, that we proposed. Uh, take a bunch of uh, sites on which electrons can sit. Some, you know, there'll be an infinite number of them eventually, but here it took a finite number. And put the electrons down. So the purple circles are the electrons. And now we're going to allow them to move. Now what happens in a metal, as I've said, is after some, uh, some renormalization, each electron just basically moves on its own, even after, you know, once you get rid of the dust around it. This is basically a point that will move on its own. But just say by, by declare that I want to study the case where the electrons can't move on their own. So how are they going to move? Well, they're going to move in pairs. That's it. So you would allow, pick any two electrons uh, and let them move in pairs from occupied sites to empty sites. So there's an exclusion principle that says they can't occupy the same, two electrons can't occupy the same state. You have to respect that. And that's it. Now, this is not as if the electrons are paired. I, now, each electron is forgotten which, what it was paired with. So there's some other pair that moves this way, and then, then, then that, and there's another one, and so on. Each time an electron wants to move, it randomly picks a partner. So it's just totally polygamous, and then they move together to some random location. And the amplitude, the probability that it happens, uh, is, is a random number. And that really is the complete definition of the SYK model. Uh, there's nothing else to it. Uh, just take a bunch of random numbers and let the electrons move in pairs randomly. So this is a model, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so a slight variant of this model is what I proposed with my graduate student in 1992. Uh, we thought it would be of no interest to anybody, but it's now at the center of many discussions of, uh, of strange metals and, and something we never imagined, uh, also of black holes. All right, so this, in some ways, is a, is a, is a, is a model where the, uh, it has nothing but entanglement. Every time an electron moves, it's entangling with somebody uh, randomly, and then uh, the other electrons are moving also. Uh, uh, all of this is happening at the same time. This is, you're not supposed to think of this as time. This is all happening together. The actual state is the sum of all these states that I showed you. Just like in the interference experiment, the actual state was left plus right. Here it's, uh, you know, sum of, you know, very large number of terms, exponentially large number of terms, and each of them has a different configuration of electrons, and they're connected by these random moves of pairwise random moves, and that's it. All right, so this model, it turns out, even though it's complicated to, you know, it looks hard to work with, because it has all this randomness in it, that makes it easy to solve. Uh, and if you come tomorrow, I'll, I'll write down the equation that we can solve many properties of this, of this model. And among the things you find, that there's no quasi-particles. In some ways, perhaps that's not a surprise, because we just prohibited each electron from moving. But you might wonder, you know, as even though they're moving in pairs, maybe this electron moves, the other electron is just its cloud, and eventually some quasi-particle emerge. 
And why it's a black hole, well, just hold on to that. I'll tell you in a few minutes. All right, so this is a, a very recent work and some not so recent work uh, where this is made into an actual model of a strange metal. So each dot, each circle here uh, is basically a realization of this picture. So you think of this as some atom with many orbitals. So, and what's happening here is electrons are all entangling with each other uh, and becoming incoherent. That is, they're just in some entangled mess so that each electron has lost its identity completely. It's entangled with everybody else. But then you allow for some electrons to hop out and liberate themselves from the entangled mess and go to another mess on a different site. So this particular model of lattice of SYK dots, as it's called, is also solvable. And it's really the first model uh, in which you can reproduce uh, the resistance being linear in temperature and much larger than H over E squared. Uh, and without quasi-particles. So, so it's incoherent, uh, bad, and strange. Okay. <laughs> so that's roughly then uh, a simple picture of how we're entangling electrons uh, intensively on a local region. Uh, prohibits them from moving, but doesn't get rid of their metallic behavior. They still move, but they move in a way the resistance is very large and has, has rather bizarre temperature dependencies. Uh, so that's a summary of uh, many years of work. Uh, of how you might get a model where entanglement leads to strange metals. All right, so, oh, one more thing to say about strange metals. I can also, yeah, so this I've already said. I can also ask the question of thermal equilibration. Remember I mentioned that for systems with quasi-particles, you can use the Boltzmann equation to figure out how the quasi-particles collide and eventually become thermal. So you can ask the same question here. Uh, suppose I took the strange metal and gave it a kick uh, it'll eventually come to rest in some uh, thermal state. How long does it take? Well, the answer turns out to be amazingly simple, and this was something, uh, this, this basic universal number. This T is the temperature in absolute uh, units. Kb is Boltzmann constant, but it's really a fake constant. It's only there because we measure temperatures in degrees Kelvin or degrees centigrade. If you measured temperature in units of energy, which is what we really should do, this Kb wouldn't be there. So it's not really a fundamental constant of nature, it's just a constant uh, there because we made a stupid choice in the scale of temperature. This is a fundamental constant, it's Planck's constant divided by two pi. So you have a complicated model of strange metal, there's many of them, it's got many different parameters in it. Uh, it turns out, independent of all of those parameters, it doesn't matter how strong the interactions are, how fast the electrons are moving, all of that drops out. There's just a basic universal time which is Planck constant divided by temperature. That's the time it takes to equilibrate. All right, so I haven't told you why that time appears, uh, but just remember that time, okay. <laughs> H bar over temperature. All right, so now finally I've done with the now uh, much current research of the last 25 years, so we're moving along rapidly. Uh, so let's just get on to black holes then. So now we're going to change gears completely uh, and talk about black holes. So black holes were you know, mostly theoretical objects, first discovered in the 30s by solving Einstein's theory of general relativity. And then after Chandrasekhar's work on white dwarfs and so on, uh, started to be taken seriously as something that actually exists. Uh, when I was in graduate school, there were no actual sightings of black holes. Uh, people with, you know, some pioneers like Stephen Hawking were working on them, but they were just viewed as, uh, at least at Harvard, uh, as people who were going down some pointless path because there were no actual black holes in the universe. Today, the situation is completely different. We know there are black holes everywhere. We know every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in its core. Uh, and so it's a very active field of, and very exciting field of research, uh, not least uh, because of the observation in LIGO. All right, so what is a black hole? Well, a black hole is so dense, an object so compact, that even light cannot escape. Uh, so the gravitational pull of the black hole pulls light. Uh, this follows from the equivalence principle of, uh, of Einstein. Any energy behaves like mass, and it gets attracted back uh, by gravity to the, to the rest of the mass. And so light can't escape. And so whatever is inside the black hole is forever lost to you. Uh, not, no information, light, or anything can ever get out of the black hole. Uh, and, and what's trapped uh, is trapped inside this radius called the Schwarzschild radius or the horizon. This is the horizon beyond which uh, the, the point of no return for the matter inside. 
It's related to Newton's constant g, the mass of the matter that's in here, and the velocity of light. So this very basic formula comes out of the solution of Einstein's equation of general relativity. All right, so that's what a black hole is. And as I said uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, September 14th, LIGO detected uh, through the gravitational waves a pair of black holes merging, uh, which are 1.3 billion light years away. Uh, each of them has a radius of only about 100 kilometers, but is 30 times the heavy, um, the mass of a, of a sun. So quite an incredible event, uh, which was detected by the, uh, the gravitational waves in this famous signal that I'm sure you've all seen. What I want to focus on, for reasons that are not clear as yet, uh, is this very last bit of the black hole, the so-called ring down time. So after some time, the, once the collision has happened, the, the black hole becomes a featureless sphere in Einstein's equation. It's just a blob in the universe sitting right there, which is just basically, the, that's, that's it, it's just a sphere with no characteristics whatsoever. And so then you can ask, how long does it take to ring down? This very last exponential decay, how long does it take? For this particular black hole, that was computed uh, by solving Einstein's equation, and you get this number of eight milliseconds. So very, very quick, these 60 solar masses become a featureless single black hole, which is spherical in shape. All right, uh, so now let's go back in time a little bit. As I mentioned, Hawking, already in 74, had started thinking about what happens when you take Einstein's equation, general relativity for a black hole, and combine them with quantum mechanics. So this was very visionary, because we didn't even know black holes were around, but why don't we think of, you know, he, he had the vision to look at these problems, uh, he and others, and particular Bekenstein uh, earlier had said that a black hole, uh, thinking about quantum mechanics and black holes, had come up with the idea of entropy in a black hole, uh, and Hawking made that more precise. So I'm just going to give you a very rough uh, picture of what the kind of process Hawking was thinking about. And it again has to do with entanglement. So I talked about entanglement between uh, an electron in, between two nuclei of a hydrogen atom. And I talked about separating the electrons between here and the moon. Well, the logical next thing to do is talk about separating the electrons inside and outside a black hole. Why not? So you take my, your favorite hydrogen molecule, you're gonna separate the two electrons, uh, and the one will fall inside the black hole and the other will stay outside. Imagine this thought experiment. And this is uh, what Hawking showed where this process is actually happening all the time on the surface of a black hole, just from fluctuations in quantum mechanics. Uh, so even though, so I can't send any signal from the inside, so this is the poor black hole, which is poor electron inside the black hole, which is eventually going to be destroyed at the center uh, by colliding with everything else. We don't quite know what happens to it. But while it's alive and inside the horizon, it's still entangled with the particle outside. So quantum mechanics will say, even now, even though I can't possibly send any information at all, it's impossible for me to send a light beam and tell the outer electron whether I'm up or down. But we still believe that even in this state, uh, they're entangled. I mean, this, this is up, the other is down, and vice versa, even across the horizon of a black hole. So that's the, the amazing consequence now of quantum entanglement taken to almost a ridiculous extreme where you're separating the electrons. We can never see each other again, at least classically. All right, so, so, so that's the, what I've already said. They, no, this is the ultimate and long-range entanglement. Uh, where you're forever separating the two constituents of an entangled pair. Uh, now, if I'm outside, since I can never see the, the electron that's inside, as far as I'm concerned, this electron is both up and down, and it's randomly both up and down. It's really a random state. It's not entangled with anything because I can't see the other thing. So that roughly is the idea of entropy and temperature. So this, this is random. So there's some element of randomness that suddenly come in, uh, so it's as if it's in some uh, thermal state. It's called a temperature, and temperature is all about randomness and entropy. So that was uh, Hawking's brilliant calculation, who actually computed very precisely the number of what the entropy of a black hole is and what the temperature of a black hole is. So we call them, so this, uh, earlier, Bekenstein had proposed the entropy, so we call it the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, and it's the Hawking temperature. All right, so now let me go back to this ring down time. 
So now the new view is that this uh, black hole is not just a featureless sphere. It's actually a thermal object. It's a black body sitting there. It's got some temperature. It's got lots of excitations around it. It's quantum fluctuating. It's really very, very active. It's got a temperature. And so we, let's think of it as a quantum system. Uh, and it has a temperature. So then this particular process of the ring down of the black hole is another example of this thermal equilibration process I've been talking about. You've kicked the black hole, and it comes back to rest. How long did, so it's a quantum system which you've kicked, and it comes back to rest. So then you ask, how long did it take uh, to come back to rest? Well, I already know what the answer is. That was computed before I knew anything about Hawking's work. So then I can take Hawking's temperature. He has an expression for it. And amazingly, you find uh, this time is exactly this time, where I put in the value of the Hawking temperature here. So it's, again, this very fundamental uh, time related to Planck's constant and temperature, uh, which appears. So it, uh, it seems as if that if I think of a black hole with all this quantum entangled from the inside and outside as some ordinary quantum system, uh, well, it, the only quantum system that behaves like it are strange metals or systems without quasi-particles, because those are the only systems we know in, in our little crystals that have this rapid equilibration time. All other systems, ordinary metals, have much longer equilibration time. So that's uh, you know, the best I can do into giving you uh, a window as to why this crazy connection might be true. Uh, the, these are systems, black holes and strange metals, are systems that equilibrate very, very, very quickly, quickest possible way, in this very basic time, Planck's constant divided by temperature. Uh, so that's the connection. So now let me uh, have about five, 10 minutes or so, uh, say a little bit more about the SYK model and how it's a black hole. Uh, so here's, there's a rather more precise connection, and, uh, and here it is. So imagine I take, this is, this is a picture of the SYK model, and I put it in some space here. Let's imagine this is a two-dimensional space, and it's sitting on the surface. Uh, and here I've solved the property of a strange metal, which is sitting right here. Now it turns out there is a certain theory of gravity uh, whose quantum mechanics exactly reproduces all the low energy properties, not just this equilibration time, but really many of the other correlations that you can think of. Uh, there's a very much more precise statement that I, I don't have the tools to explain, but anyway, there is a certain theory of gravity that has the same properties as this model. So what is that theory of gravity? Well, that theory of gravity has the feature that it lives in one higher dimension. So that's really crucial. So this particular system is, say, living in two dimensions. So then I have two space and one time. And I have to take a theory of gravity which lives uh, in three space and one time. So there's what's called an emergent direction. And out there in this emergent direction is the black hole. So this is an example or, or similar to what uh, Navamita called the ADS safety correspondence, which was discovered in string theory in a much more complicated set of models on this side, which connects quantum systems without quasi-particles in d dimensions to gravity theories in d plus one dimensions. Uh, so that's a very deep connection, uh, first made by Maldasena, uh, which uh, really is what also being realized, a different version of it in the SYK model. Uh, and so you have a th Einstein's theory in, in three dimensions here, with a certain, and it's a certain type of Einstein action. It's got a negative curvature of space-time. The cosmological constant has to be negative. So you get what's called anti decider space. And if you take this particular black hole and, and you look at its quantum fluctuations, and this particular black hole seems, turns out in some limits to be quite simple to analyze. And when you do that, uh, you find that these are the same system. So that's, so that's the duality, if you wish, between a quantum system without quasi-particles in one dimension, in d dimensions, and a gravity system in one higher dimension. Now, this particular duality then helps us understand these mysterious connections I've mentioned so far. First of all, this immediately tells you that the equilibration time has to be the same. And I just said any black hole in any space time has this time of h-bar over Hawking temperature. It tells you why the black hole has a temperature to begin with. And there's another feature of the black hole entropy, which I didn't mention, that the entropy of a black hole is proportional to its surface area. This is something Hawking and Bekenstein discovered. 
and was also seen as really, really bizarre. How can entropy be proportional to surface area? Everything else in the universe uh, that we've studied, the entropy is proportional to the volume, uh, including strange metals. So then how does this work? So here a strange metal is in D dimensions, so its volume is the same as the surface area of this black hole because the black hole is in one more dimension. So it also helps explain that. All right, so I'm going to just finish by giving you some pictures of why, why, why do we need this extra dimension. And this extra dimension is intimately connected to entanglement. So what I show here uh, is what's called a tensor network picture of entanglement. So this is, think of this as my electrons sitting in some D, capital D dimensional <laughs> space. So the electrons are sitting there and they're starting to entangle. And this, this is a picture of the entanglement where these two electrons entangle with each other and then this red entangles the pairs of electrons with the pairs of electrons and so on and so forth. So this one particular picture, the SYK model may not be exactly like this, it, but it still had this structure of pairs entangling and then, then those pairs could entangle in some complicated with the other ones. And, uh, and so there's many levels of entanglement or depths of entanglement. And, and if I want to describe the full quantum wave function, uh, I have to worry about all these depths of entanglement uh, and the easy way to do that is to think of this depth as another dimension of space. So that's really the deep connection between emergent dimensions of space. And so in one theory, you have more dimensions than the other one because in the, in the theory of gravity, you're trying to describe uh, this web of entanglement by equations of gravity. And the amazing thing is that they do obey equations that look like gravity. That's kind of the things that SYK model shows you. Uh, here's another picture. Uh, if you were a string theory person, you would say, here are my quantum systems sitting in this d-dimensional space. String theory is called a d-brain. And these are connected by strings which are entangling them. And you need that extra dimension for the strings to, uh, to move around. So, so that's why uh, there's an emergent spatial direction in the gravity theory that's equivalent to this entangled strange metal. It's all about entanglement, as I said earlier. Uh, so quantum entanglement is what leads to an emergent spatial dimension. And uh, I think that's all I have to say. So, yeah, so, the, so to conclude, uh, in my little world of metals in crystals, we encountered this bizarre state of matter which has no quasi-particles and which thermalizes as quickly as possible. Uh, and amazingly, those are also properties of all black holes in quantum gravity. And it's more than just a coincidence, there are certain simple black holes that in fact look exactly like strange metals. Uh, it's not to say that real black hole in, the, in our universe looks anything like a strange metal, they don't. Uh, you have to be in this very special curved space time. Uh, but nevertheless, there is, this, there is a very deep connection between these, uh, these facts here. So thank you very much. Thank you for this wonderful lecture and we certainly look forward to tomorrow's talk where you will give us the details. And I uh, forgot to mention something that his visit uh, here to ISR is being sponsored by a grant from Precision Nowhere Company to Gravity Group. And we are happy that we had that grant and that's why we could have him here. Thank you. Thank you.